invite you to open up your Bibles or your devices to Genesis chapter 37 today. Genesis chapter 37. We are continuing uh, in our series called Kill Joys, Waging War Against Sins Underneath the Surface. And last week, if you weren't here, I, here, I encourage you to, to go back and list, take a listen to it. But we looked at Genesis chapter 3, specifically at the sins of pride and rebellion. We stated last week that really pride and rebellion are what leads to every other form of sin. Because in pride, in our pride, we decide we know better than God, and then we disobey. And now I, I recognize that in our pride, we don't often say we know better than God, because that would be wrong, right? To actually say what you're thinking, that'd be wrong. But we believe it. And we often take a very weak approach to sin in our own lives, while we easily take a harsh approach to sin in, in other people. But the truth is that all sin, regardless of what it is, is actually defiant rebellion against the God of the universe. And these sins that we, we kind of tolerate, the ones that we, we kind of see as, as tolerable are actually stealing our joy and, and killing our joy. And so today we want to look at two more killjoys that often fall into the category of sins we ignore or just tolerate. And those sins are envy and anger. See, pride and rebellion, at least in my mind, they seem kind of general. Uh, but when we talk about envy and anger, we're getting a little more personal, right? At least for you, I've never struggled with envy or with anger, at least in the last 30 seconds, right? The truth is envy and anger come very naturally to us, even from a, a very, very early age. Uh, I, I was thinking about this this week, and I remember the first time I remember feeling envy. Now, I'm sure it wasn't the first time it actually happened, but the first time I remember feeling envy. See, in third grade, we moved across town, and we, we bought a new house in this neighborhood, and I, I met a, a next-door neighbor who, they had a family that were the same age as our kids, and so we started hanging out, and I went over to his house, and they had, like, this amazing house in an amazing property. They had they had a fishing pond, and they had a creek running through their backyard, and they had this really amazing swimming pool, and they had a BMX track and, and a go-kart track in their backyard. And they had pets. Like, they had, they had a couple Dalmatians. They had cats. The, the coolest pet was they had a pig named Bacon <laughs> that you could actually ride. So I got to ride Bacon quite a few times. So all of that was cool. But the thing that made me the most envious, the most jealous, was that my friend at the age of nine had a mini fridge in his bedroom. I don't know if you all have that, but that's luxury. And it wasn't just a mini fridge. It was filled with soda, specifically Mountain Dew. Which I, we didn't get to have soda very much in, in our house. And when we did, it was always diet caffeine free like Coke, which is just brown water, essentially, with some bubbles in it. And so when I went into this ni other nine-year-old's room and, and, and saw that he had a mini fridge fully stocked with Mountain Dew, I was jealous. Beyond reason, I was so jealous. I'm like, I, I want that. I want that for myself. And this went on, honestly, it, it sounds ridiculous, but it went on for years and affected the way uh, I lived my life. And for, when I got my first job, I got, sorry, child labor laws aside, I got my first job when I was 12. I was cleaning rabbit cages. It wasn't a great job. Don't worry about it. But I got my first job every day on the way to school. I would stop at the gas station and buy 10 Mountain Dews. I would drink two of them, and then I would sell the other eight out of my locker like a crack dealer <laughs> because sixth graders operate on Mountain Dew. But the only reason I did that is because I thought it would elevate my status. I saw this thing that this, this other kid had. I saw that the wealth that they had and, and that this, if I could do this one thing, then it would make my life better. And while it's humorous to think about the envy of an eight, nine-year-old boy, it was the start 
or a root of envy in my life that went unchecked for quite some time. Envy is, is a sin that will lead to unchecked anger and eat away at our joy. Here's the main idea that I want to chase today as we dive into our text. Envy and unchecked anger are increasingly destructive threats to our joy and relationships. Key there, increasingly destructive. Many pastors have said it like this in the past. It says, sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay. And that's especially true with envy and with what it produces in us unchecked anger. And today, I want to look at a, a very, very familiar story, the story of Joseph and his brothers. And when we, we open up the Bible to Genesis 37, we often look at this story and we, we often focus on God's sovereignty in the life of Jesus. And he, he did some incredible work to preserve him. And it's worthwhile to look at that. But when we look at the brothers specifically, we see a pretty sinister spiral of envy and jealousy covetousness, anger, comparison, and hate. So I think it, it does us well to look at this story and, and evaluate these killjoys that not only exist in 11 brothers of Joseph, but that also exist in us. So let's look first at the envy and anger in Joseph's brothers. Let's dig in. Genesis 37, starting in verse 1. It says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy and with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. So I know we're, we're not digging in too far, but it's important for us to stop for a moment and, and look at where we've been so far in the book of Genesis. We started last week talking about Adam and Eve and, and how they sinned and took on pride and rebellion. And since then, the whole world has been messed up with sin. In fact, it didn't take very long for it to reach a fever pitch. One generation later, Cain and Abel, we have the first murder. Can you imagine that? Their parents still remembering the beauty of the Garden of Eden, and there is a murder in their family. And it ke keeps getting worse and worse and worse until in Genesis 6, things got so bad that God decided he had to wipe people off of the face of the earth and sent a global flood and started over with Noah. But, newsflash, even after the flood, people are still dumb. They're still dumb. And we find pretty soon that they have try, they are trying to elevate themselves above God again. They say, let us build for ourselves a city that reaches up to God. And we know now we call that the Tower of Babel. And God, in order to ruin that work, he actually gives everyone a different language for the first time in history. And it scatters people all over the known world at that time. And at that time, God calls a man named Abram. And there's nothing really special about Abram. He's not a son of a king. Or he's, not, he's not a son of the God. He's not, he's not anything special, but he's righteous, and he's upright, and he walks with God. And so God calls Abram, and he makes a covenant with Abraham and says, By, through you, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And I'm going to give you descendants that, that outnumber the stars and outnumber the, the sand on the seashore. And Abraham and his wife Sarah laugh at that, but soon we see in Genesis 21 that the, the son of promise, Isaac, is born. And Isaac has uh, two boys as well. He has Esau and Jacob, who we just saw mentioned in the story. And, and Jacob, we know is, from Scripture, is a trickster. And he tricks his father into giving him us, giving him his brother's birthright. But then in a, in a scenario that's simply ironic, Jacob is actually tricked by his father-in-law. If you'll remember the story, Jacob wants to marry this woman, Rachel. And so she goes to her father and says, I want to marry your daughter. He says, work for me for seven years. And he works for Laban for seven years. 
and he has a wedding, and I don't, I don't know how this happens. We can dig, dig into this later. He wakes up the morning after his wedding, and he's not in bed with Rachel. He's actually in bed with, his, with Rachel's sister, Leah. He was tricked. And then he wants to still marry Rachel, so he works another seven years in, in order to marry Rachel. And now we, we have this family unit established, but that's just, it's just absolutely a mess. There's R Rachel and there's Leah, and we find out in the passage this morning that he actually had two other wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. I don't know what kind of names those are, but I can tell you four wives is not a good idea for anybody, right? One is more than enough. One is more than enough. <laughs> so Jacob now, who we also call Israel, has 12 sons by four different women. If that's not reality TV, I don't know what is. So now we have that all straight. Look, look again at, at, at verse 2. It said, And Joseph brought a bad report of them, the brothers, to their father Jacob. And now Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. See, this is, this is the seed of envy and anger. Okay, it's, it starts all as something pretty simple. You have an annoying 17-year-old brother who's tattling on you, okay? But that's just the tip of the iceberg. And this isn't just typical little brother behavior. This is the job given to him by his father, as we're going to see in just a little bit. See, Joseph was the second youngest son in his family. This should not have been his role at all. But we find out in, in verse 3 that the reason he has this job of tattletale is because he's Jacob's favorite. It says he's the son of his old age. He's also the son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. And what we don't see here right in chapter 37 is that in chapter 36, when Rachel was giving birth to her last son, she actually dies. So not only is this the favorite son of the favorite wife, but now we have a father who's mourning the loss of his wife, and it comes through as this favoritism. And as if the, the blatant favoritism isn't enough, Jacob gives him this coat of many, many colors. Now, I'm sure in your mind you've thought through this before and thought, uh, you probably have a picture in your head of what that coat looked like, right? We all do. I tend to think it looked like the coolest coat I ever owned, which was a Phoenix Sun starter jacket that I had in third grade that was bright purple and orange. Probably didn't look like that. But the point of what it looked like actually isn't the whole point. We like to draw it out in stories and see it on display. But what th the point is the symbolism. See, it could be also translated that it was a coat with long sleeves. And if you worked in an agricultural area, if you were wearing long sleeves, it meant you were not doing physical labor. See, this coat was a coat designed for a ruler. And so Jacob is establishing Joseph as a ruler over his brothers and over his sisters. And so the root of envy for the brothers was, was the love their father had for Joseph over and before and above the love he had for the rest of them. But the envy is compounded by Joseph's actions. It says there that they could not speak peace of, peacefully to him. In the Hebrew, it, it, this is it's what's called a PL verb, which indicates intense action. So anytime you see that, you see a simple word, they could not speak. That literally means they had no power to speak nicely to him, or they refused to speak to him. And we could probably stop right here, and we have a, enough for, for a sermon on envy, but there's something more in these actions in this story that we need to see, and that's the progression of envy and anger. It might start as something small or something we seem relatively insignificant, but it quickly unravels and gets out of control. 
In verse 5, we see this. It says that, Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we are binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my, my sheep arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. This is the compounding effect of sin. It's building on top of each other. Because envy, a desire to have what someone else has, is now turned into hatred and anger. And by this point, I'm not even sure the brothers know who they hate the most. Could be their dad, because he loves Joseph more and set him to rule over them. It could be God, because apparently God is, is giving Joseph these dreams, affirming the rule that he has. Or it could be Joseph, simply because he has what they want. But the progression continues, and it says in verse 9 that he has another dream. It says, Then he dreamed another dream, and told it to his brothers, and said, Behold, I have, I have dreamed another dream. And at this point, you're like, Joseph, just be quiet. Could have saved himself a lot of trouble, but it says, Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind. And at this point, it seems that Joseph's predisposition and inclination towards ruling goes even beyond his father's desire. See, Jacob and the wives were, were fine that this, this he was ruling over and he had a position of power over the other grown men, the other sons. But to say that God is telling you that you will rule over your mother and your father also was taking it too far. And this recent G dream not only has him rebuking Joseph, not only has Jacob rebu rebuking Joseph, it also has the brothers spiraling again. He uses the word here, jealous. They were jealous of him. Could be translated envy, but again, it's one of those intense verbs in Hebrew. This wasn't just run-of-the-mill envy. It's envy on steroids. The type of envy that leads to action. It's one thing for me to look out across the street and see my, my neighbor's brand new car. It's another thing for me to adjust my entire life so that I can get that car. And not just one like it, but that specific one. And that's what's happening in the life of these brothers. That's where the story leads next. It shows us the results of of this ever-increasing envy and anger in verses 12. In verse 12. Continues the story, and it says, Now his brothers, Joseph's brothers, went to pasture their flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. He said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he w sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields, and the man asked him, What are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. See, this is, this is the type of rule that Jacob wants, Israel wants for Joseph. The, the type of rule that his brothers hate. So if you can imagine, these are all grown men. Joseph, the second youngest, he's 17 years old. He's given a ruler's coat and said, and set out to tattle on his brothers. So not only are they in the fields doing physical labor, their brother, the 17-year-old, is standing watch over them to make sure they aren't making mistakes. And at times, he even bought, brought bad reports about them. And so in this scene, he's sent from Hebron to Shechem to see what, what's happening. 
and we see that Joseph is wandering around in a field. Now, when I first read this, I, I, I thought Joseph kind of comes across as an entitled idiot, right? Because we don't have cornfields here in Boulder City. Uh, back where we're from in Michigan, Indiana, there's plenty of them. And if you see a man wandering around in a cornfield, something is wrong with him. And in this story, Joseph is wandering around in a field. But it's not because he's an entitled idiot. It's because his brothers are not where they're supposed to be. See, Jacob dwells in and sends Joseph from Hebron to Shechem. And we think, sometimes we read these stories and we're like, oh, that's just like across the street, right? So like your brothers are playing on a playground, go check on them and make sure they're doing okay. No, Hebron and Shechem are 50 miles apart. So Joseph has, has walked or maybe ridden a camel for days, maybe even a week. And then this man comes up to him while he's wandering around the field and tells him, no, they're, they're not in Shechem. They actually moved on to Dothan which is another 64 miles away. So Joseph is, is not just like on his bike pedaling to the neighbor's house to make sure his brothers are doing what they're supposed to do. He's walking 114 miles to find where his brothers are supposed to be. And at the very least, the brothers just aren't where they're supposed to be. And that happens. But at the most, I think this is where the story leads us, is that their envy and their hatred and their anger have driven the brothers as far from Joseph and Jacob as possible. They've driven them away. And when they, they can't, can't get away, they finally realize, we've, we've just gone 114 miles from home, and here this clown comes again, 114 miles from home. When they see that, the plot thickens. They have such hatred in their hearts, envy and jealousy, and covetousness, they make this plan. It says in verse 18 that they saw him from afar, and before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. See, envy has given way to hatred, and to anger. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 6 that murder, the thing that they're plotting in their hearts, is the outward working of deep internal hate. That's where the brothers are at. It says that they conspired against him, meaning that they, they together were planning to be crafty and deceitful. What's interesting here is they, they actually give him a name. They, call, they say, here, here comes this dreamer. And you could actually translate that in Hebrew to mean Lord or owner, meaning they're making a, a mockery of him or saying, here comes the one who thinks he is our boss. Kill him. Their envy, their hatred have led them to this. And this may not seem like a significant thing, just, just a name that they're calling him, but this is a, a very significant moment. Because their envy, their hatred, their anger have caused to get them to give their brother an identity that is not fitting. Meaning not only has it robbed them of their joy, it is now well beyond the point of hurting their relationships, as envy often does. Because they envy him, in their minds he's no longer the same person. We've all been here. We are so jealous sometimes of someone and what they might have that we begin to make up in our minds stories to diminish their importance or to diminish their reputation, even though in reality they haven't done anything wrong. We begin to tell ourselves lies so that, that we can justify our hatred towards people, our anger, our, our jealousy of someone. And if we can make them look bad or at least make them at least make ourselves think that they're evil, then it's, it's more justifiable that we don't like them anymore. And that's what's happening with, with Joseph's brothers. But envy and anger are, are not done being destructive here. See, they, they have a plan to kill Joseph, but in God's providence, the brother Reuben has a sudden moment of doubt or change of heart. 
he ends up actually sparing Joseph's life. It says this in verse 21, but then when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the symbol of envy, the robe of many colors that he wore. And they took him and threw him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water. So here envy takes a step further. It's no longer just being jealous of the neighbor's house. It's become covetousness. Because envy is desiring what another person has, but covetousness is desiring it so much that you don't want them to have it anymore. So it's not just, I want the car, I want the new thing. It's, I want it so badly that I don't want them to have it anymore. I want it just for myself. And maybe we think at this point, at least Joseph is alive, right? They didn't murder him, but the envy can't get any worse. Well, it does. It says this, and they sat down to eat, verse 25. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. You guys remember somebody else that was sold for a few pieces of silver? Jesus. Then they took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben had returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and where shall I go? The first sentence there in verse 25 is mind-boggling to me. It says they, they, they sat down to eat. Joseph is in a pit. Their brother, who they just called their own flesh and blood, is in a pit waiting to die. And his brothers are so callous to how far sin has taken them that they're eating lunch. Well, their brother is waiting to die. And then... They decide instead of killing him or just leaving them there for dead, that they're going to turn a profit from Joseph's demise. They're going to sell him into slavery. Can you see how crazy envy has become increasingly destructive? It just keeps building, it keeps building, keeps spiraling, keeps spiraling, because now envy has turned into unchecked anger, and, and anger has turned into hatred, and hatred has turned into covetousness, and, cal- and covetousness has turned into callousness. And callousness has turned into these despicable actions. And their despicable behavior leads to a massive cover-up. As it often does, when you let things spiral out of control, you will be shocked at how many lies you will tell. But look at verse 31. We see the plan. We see the cover-up. Then they took Joseph's robe and they slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in blood, and they they sent the robe of many colors and, and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it's your son's robe or not. And they identified it and said, It's my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. For a minute, can can you imagine hating a person so much that you plot to kill them, and then instead of killing them, you, you sell them into slavery and fake their death. It seems unfathomable for us, but it all started with envy. It started with brothers hating that their, their younger brother was being a tattletale, hating that he got shown more love than a father, and it ends in a murderous plot and a cover-up. I remind you of the quote we shared at the beginning. It says, sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And the brothers, I'm sure they never expected 
end this way. And at the end of chapter 37, we, we, we get a glimpse of the fallout from all of this. And it's not stated directly, but there, we see here in their actions that there's a moment where they're, where they're thinking, what have I done? What have we done? And for them, the consequences of their envy, the consequences of their anger become real for just a minute. And it shows us this in verse 34. It says, Then Jacob, after hearing this news, tore his garments and put on sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son for many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him, Joseph, in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. See, the family here is, this is amazing to me, they're trying to comfort Jacob for something that isn't even true. But something in this moment leads them to this place that, this isn't just like a typical comfort. I know when like if Maddox falls down on the ground while he's using his scooter or something, he's got a scrape on his knee, I'll go up to him and be like, it's okay, it's okay, and I'll put a Band-Aid on it and, and give him a sucker or whatever to make it feel better. That It's not that type of comfort. It's not so simple. It's one of those intensive verbs again, meaning their attempts to comfort her, him were intense they never stopped trying to comfort him. Because while they, they hated Joseph and they wanted him dead, they did not like what they were seeing in their father in this moment. And it bears mentioning here that we can choose our actions, but just like these brothers, we cannot choose our consequences. They chose to let envy and anger get the best of them, and they would pay the consequences for years to come. In fact, if you fast forward to Genesis chapter 50, you see that they are still dealing with the fallout of this decision. Despite their best effort, Jacob still mourns. As much as they try to comfort him, he is just as intensely rejecting their comfort. And then we get this weird kind of footnote at the end about Joseph. See, this story, honestly, in, in chapter 37 is not really about Joseph yet. It says that he was sold to Potiphar, the captain of the guard in Egypt. See, his, his story's not done yet. Life isn't done being hard for him. But it should be noted that the, the envy and the anger of, of these brothers that they used for evil, God redirects and uses for good. He eventually uses this moment to save the nation of Israel. And it's important for us to note this because we need to know that envy and anger will not disrupt the sovereign plans of God in your life or in other people's lives. He, he can still use those situations to accomplish his good. And so when we, we talk about our own envy and our own anger, that, those feelings, those emotions, those sins, those killjoys are not going to disrupt his plan, but what happens is it robs you of joy. It robs you of the good that he wants to accomplish in you. They won't stop his plan, but they will do what we said at the beginning. Envy and unchecked anger are increasingly destructive threats to our joy in relationships. So then we, we must place ourselves in this story and ask the question, what does envy and anger look like in us? What does envy and anger produce in us. And I just want to talk very, very briefly about three pretty common ways it manifests itself in our lives. And I don't do this to make you feel guilty, okay? I hope you know that. But I do it so that we can recognize, I can recognize when we might be spiraling in envy like the brothers were. So first, the way it materializes in our lives is it just envy, just jealousy. We want something someone else has. Now, it's not wrong to think what someone else has is pretty cool or awesome. For a nine-year-old kid to have a mini fridge stocked full with Mountain Dew is a pretty awesome thing in, in real life. That's not where the problem lies. The problem comes when it begins to change our response. 
And we can know that envy has gripped our life when we can no longer rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. And instead of celebrating something good in the life of a friend or a family member, we actually use it to solidify our lack of contentment. It's okay to, to notice nice things. God has given those things to us. But when it causes us to, to respond differently, when it causes us to evaluate our life choices so we can get more and get more, we know that envy has taken root. Second, envy and anger show up in comparison. We can honestly spend an entire month right here, but lunch is coming, and so we got to move on. But comparison is a thief of joy, and there's no place for it in the family of God. I no, long, I no longer have social media on my phone for this reason, because I, you, you guys have been, probably been there too, where you can, you can spend hours scrolling through Instagram, through Facebook, through, through Twitter, or whatever it's called now, X, or whatever the dumb name they gave it. And you start to look at what people have. You start to look at what they're doing. You start to, to look at, at, at all the other things that families are doing. Or you start to look at the vacations they get to go on. Or you start to look at the extravagance with which they live. Or the manicured life they get to live. And you begin to be, get jealous and compare your life to theirs. And if that's you, get off social media. Get rid of it. I know I, I, it was a huge struggle for me when I was doing that because I, I had this lie in the back of my head where I thought, well, people are going to really, really miss out on my life, life updates. Guys, we are not that important. I am not that important. People do not care enough. And so when, it, when you free yourself from that, it's liberating. So how about we just try living in the moments instead of documenting them all the time? We don't have to take pictures of everything. We don't have to share everything that's going on. God calls us to live in that moment. And so comparison with other people's lives, with what other people have, can kill and steal your joy. Third, envy and anger show up in hatred. I won't make you get specific, and I won't either, but right now, if you and I are honest, there, there are people in our lives that we hate simply because we don't have what they have. Simply because their life looks a little bit better than ours. Simply because they, they have the things that we desire. And I would bet and more, th more than one person in this room has tried to give that, those people a new identity in, their, in our minds. To compromise their reputation so we can feel about, better about hating them. Friends, family, these things are killing our joy. Envy, comparison, hatred, jealousy, unchecked anger, covetousness. They are robbing you of joy, but they're also robbing you of the life and the relationships God intended for you to have. It's not meant to be like this. And so how do we deal with them before they reach the fever pitch and destroy everything like it did in the lives of Joseph and his brothers? So how do we wage war against envy and anger? And just like last week, this, this may seem overly simple, but when we put off sin, we have to replace it with something, right? And so when we know we have to put off envy and, and unchecked anger, we, we must put something in its place. The things we need to put in place in our life are contentment and gratitude. Contentment and gratitude. Very simple, but not easy. See, contentment is realizing God will provide all that we need, everything we need. In fact, Jesus says it like this in, in Matthew chapter 6. If, if you don't have this section underlined in your Bible, do it today. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? 
Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he much, not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Don't misunderstand me. God will provide what you need, but he is under no obligation to provide all that you want. But contentment, contentment with godliness is great gain. We can learn to be content with much and we can con be content with little if we simply recognize that God owns it all. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and he has everything we need. He is enough. And if in your life or in my life he, he chooses not to give us something, we can trust him with that as well. We can trust him with the little that we have. So be content. Put on contentment. Secondly, put on gratitude. Gratitude is similar to contentment, but there's action with it. Gratitude is, is, is not just being okay with what we have, but actually being thankful for the little we have, the little tiny bit that we have. Philippians 4, I'm sure a, a passage you're familiar with, it says, Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I want that. I want the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, and I want it for you too. What Scripture says is, is that receiving this is directly linked to our gratitude and thanksgiving. So here's the challenge, the invitation, some how to tangibly do this. Last week, I, I asked you to study the attributes of God for a month to combat pride. This week, here's what I want you to do. To combat envy and anger, every day for a week, write down 10 things you are thankful for. Literally, write them down. Don't just think them, okay? Write them down. And at first, I'm going to tell you, you're, you're going to have a hard time thinking of things. But then you're going to start like, oh, yeah, I have more to be thankful for. I have more to be thankful for. And at the end of the week, you're going to have 70 things written down on a piece of paper, paper that God has blessed you with and provided for you above and beyond your need. And you know what those type of things do? They kill envy. They kill hatred. They kill anger. Because we lift our eyes up off of our current life's circumstances and we look at all the goodness of God in its abundance. See, envy and unchecked anger will rob us of our joy and destroy our relationships. So let's fight against them together this week. Let's pray. Father, you you have been so good to us. You've given us more than we need. You've given us even more than we want. And it's crazy to think that we're not content with that. And so, Lord, would you build in us a, a, a sense of gratitude, a sense of contentment, that we, we wouldn't be distracted by what our culture says is valuable, but, God, we would, be, we would be passionate about what you say is valuable. And the greatest thing that we can ever have in, in all this world is, is a relationship with you through your son, Jesus. And God, that's just a free gift that you give to us. And so help us to be grateful. Help us not to be envious. Help us not to have anger go unchecked. But God, I pray that we would be known as a people that whether we have a lot or whether we have little, that we would be content, that we'd be grateful for the things that you have supplied and the relationship we can have with you and others because of your son, Jesus Christ. 
We pray this in his name today. Amen.